Welcome you back to the second half hour of the program here today, produced by Dylan Bishop. It's the Friday show, which means the crew is intact, with the exception on the second Friday of each month, Michael Carl. So we do have one sub, but he's a regular sub, so we'll call him the sixth man. Basically, uh, off the ha- bench in studio, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. William, good morning to you once again. Good morning again, Rob. The, we used to call him the Sarge. Now we call him the Badger. Mike Hike, good morning to you. <laughs> good morning, sir. <laughs> and uh, Larry Schultz in the Larry Schultz seat. Great to be here once again. <laughs> I can tell the enthusiasm already. We just call him Stephen Wright when we can, and he quotes him at the end oftentimes. And in the Mike Carl seat, Alonzo Perry. Good morning, Alonzo. Good morning. It's nice to see you, Rob. Great to have you here. Always nice to be here. Yeah, you got Always. A, you got a big day tomorrow. What? Oh, yeah. My LSAT. Yep. Yeah, it's a big day. I've been studying for it for a while, so hopefully everything turns out all right for me. You well, know. Good luck to you. Yeah, I appreciate it. That'd I be do. nice. All right. Just what the world needs. Another lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but the Badger's in one of those moods this week, so he was letting it fly. <laughs> Larry, any advice? Joe, any advice for Alonzo? Well, he'll need another lawyer to take the L- uh, LSAT so he has someone to fight with. You know, the, the old story about the small town where there was one lawyer and he was starving to death. Sure. And another guy moved in and they both got rich. <laughs> <laughs> because everything creates work for eternity. Right? Yeah. Everything. Uh, All right. Gentlemen, I have uh, been blessed this week with material that... Most of you have done a good job of providing for me, and I want you to know, (laughs) as you do these five a week, week in and week out, material, sometimes you have to search for it. Other weeks, it just lands in your lap. (laughs) And this was one of those weeks where at least on one occasion it landed in my lap. So as a result of that... And we go a little (laughs) something like this. Hit it. We begin our intros this week... With the man to my left. <clears throat> Usually when we talk bills, it's Stubblefield with whom we're messing. <laughs> Not the 45 that Big Jim dumped when he called that special session. But at least the Gov gave the legislature plenty of time to begin it. Oh wait, no he didn't. He actually called it at the last minute. There were delegates running into the chambers, their legs feeling like jelly. And some were angry that day, my friends. Like an old man returning his soup at the deli. Others were so mad that they uttered some words they won't recant, like the man who created a legend when he did the Mike Kite rant. <laughs> I keep forgetting there are cameras in that chamber. <laughs> I'll bet you remember now. Though. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of people who enjoyed that rant, so kudos to you. Right. Each week he sits in his own little notch at this table and proudly wears the title as a token liberal label. He takes as good as he gives each and every week, and in exchange, he only asks that you give him the chance to speak. Larry Schultz's message has been consistent, and don't say he didn't warn you that Fannie Willis is bringing at least a dozen indictments on Trump on behalf of the state of Georgia. All right. Um, You can't get here soon enough for me. I'm an old man now. Um, It's great to be here again. It's great to have you. We don't get to see this guy as often as we'd like. Lately, it's only when there's a partners meeting involving our other panelist, Mike. Alonzo's not running for office. At least that's what he says. Not for delegate, nor commissioner. And he's not yet old enough to be prez. He says he's content to recruit other candidates. And I guess that's just fine. But one question for you, Alonzo. Is one of those recruits named Jim Klein? Ooh, Jim Klein. You know, I... He doesn't like me very much in the comments, so I don't know. We're going we're gonna to have to talk about it. We'll have to talk about it. We'll have to meet. <clears throat> well, Jim, Give me a call, Jim. We're going to have to change that right away. Yeah. Well. Uh, Joe, for you, I got special music. August is the national month for the sandwich and panini. I'll take both of those, and if you don't mind, a side of linguine. And I bet I'm not alone in that as I introduce this next fella who tops his prosciutto sub with sopra set and mortadella. But when it comes to subs, my man Joe Joey Torts Freddy ain't no pies on fool. He knows a sandwich ain't complete until you add the provolone and gabagool. (laughs) (laughs) 
Sing it with me, Joe. Uh, <laughs> oh, mama, che la luna bacana. You ready, Joe? Your line's next. <laughs> no? Uh, my, my doctor said no more gabagool. <laughs> <laughs> no more gabagool. That's a shame. In a broad-based gesture of both style and stealth, my good friend Bill Stubblefield offered to share with me half of his wealth. It caught me by surprise when Bill offered me a lot. It was half the winnings if he hit the Mega Millions jackpot. Now, if you recall, that was worth $1.5 billion in scratch. And if Bill had that kind of money, even at his age, he'd be quite the catch. <laughs> as luck... Thanks, Rob. As, you're welcome, Bill. As luck would have it, he didn't win. As you know, the lottery isn't a lock. So I guess I'll just have to settle for half of his Tesla stock. <laughs> You should have stopped at the first part. <laughs> I brought the legal forms. Larry is here as a lawyer to actually officiate over it, but I do appreciate your offer to give me half it, of your it Tesla stock. It was a genuine offer, half of my lottery winning on the last one, not the coming one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that that's an implied contract, Bill. I'm yeah. going to have to hold you to the fire on this one. All right, let's begin our session with our leadoff hitter, Joe. Joey Torts Ferretti without the Gabagool. Joe. Robin, uh, back in 2004, uh, in the lead-up to the George W. Bush-John Kerry presidential election, uh, George Bush was in a little bit of trouble. He was uh, defending a lagging economy. He had uh, passed some the, what has been known as the Bush tax cuts and trying to defend the effects of those on our debt. And, of course, he was having to defend – uh, getting the United States into the Iraq war and, and under what were legitimately uh, raised concerns about how that happened. So Carl Rove, who was his campaign manager, came up with an interesting strategy, which proved to be very effective. In 11 different states, the state GOP's uh, committees under the direction of Carl Rove made sure that referendum uh, I think the plural is referenda, were included on state ballots having to do with gay marriage. The end result was that social conservatives were went to the polls in droves, supported the notion that marriage should be between one man and one woman, and, of course, went up the ballot and voted for George W. Bush, allowing him to defeat Kerry rather handily. Uh, and especially in some of those 11 battleground states. I cite that little historical footnote because 20 years later, I think we are looking at a very similar situation leading up to the next presidential election. In the state of Ohio this week, the results were very clear that there are plenty of voters out there concerned about reproductive rights, and they – drove to the polls and voted in numbers in an off-year special election the likes of Ohio have never seen before. Three million votes cast in that state for one question, whether or not the threshold to amend the state constitution in Ohio should be raised from 50 percent to 60 percent. So my question this morning is, will we see a repeat of 2004, and should the Republicans be concerned that that very effective strategy that they came up with in 2004 will be turned on them in 2024 by the Democrats, who no doubt have seen what has happened in Ohio and in six other states where in statewide elections, reproductive rights have been supported by the voters. Will the presumptive nominee right now, Donald Trump, or whoever leads the Republican ticket, suffer from this, and what can they do to counteract what appears to be a very motivated block of voters who will be coming to the polls in support of reproductive rights? That's my question. All right, Joe, with the leadoff. So uh, when I think about somebody who's got the Republican Party's back on all occasions, without doubt, Without ever bowing his back on it one way or the other, I think of Larry Schultz. Larry, you're up first on this one. Um, uh, it it is true that they perhaps have blundered a little too far in some of the purple states <clears throat> by um, p 
pushing these culture issues. And this is a culture issue where a majority of people across the country are not interested in having the Supreme Court make it so that young women in Texas um, can't get the health care they need and have to take, uh, as they did in one case, have to take a dead fetus to term and suffer permanent, harmful, reproductive uh, physical injury as a result. And so it's, it's a complicated medical matter, regardless of what your feelings are about it. And if you think you can just ban abortion and it's, a, and it's like a light switch, it's not. Because there are a lot of cases where doctors are scared off in some of these states from providing health care to women who didn't come seeking an abortion, but who came seeking the end of an absolutely um, impossible pregnancy that will never produce a living child, and they can't get the care. So when you take the culture wars down that kind of an avenue, then, of course, there are a lot of people who say, well, wait a minute, I may not, never be in favor of an abortion, but if my daughter is four months pregnant, and the di- diagnosis is this baby will not be born um, living, then we have to have somebody who will step in. A lot of doctors in some of these states are too afraid. And most people, I think, in Ohio are starting to say, wait a minute, this is a bridge too far. It's always a danger when your party is about culture issues. You've heard me say it before. In 2020, the Republican Party ran a presidential campaign without a platform passed at their convention. And this is what results. You're fishing around for stuff where you think you can get an advantage, and sometimes these culture war things have a way of backfiring. So, yeah, I think there's trouble. Um, When a state like Kansas, as soon as Roe v. Wade came out, a state like Kansas, which nobody thinks is a purple state, it's a red state immediately has a referendum and puts it in their state constitution, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty, uh, pretty uh, loudly spoken. Let's go to Michael Heights. Well, well let me first say I, I, I don't like it when we describe abortion as health care. It's, it's not health care. Um, and you, Larry's example, I believe, are anomalies. These are very rare cases. Um, should they be looked at yes but those aren't those aren't they don't happen very often however to your question i will say the republican party does need to be concerned that the supreme court did make the right decision and they sent this decision back down to states and that's where it should be and as states make these decisions they have to know that it could affect elections in those particular states so if it's on the ballot it could absolutely affect um, those candidates that are upstream and and what position they hold on it. So uh, to answer your question, Joe, absolutely the Republican Party needs to be aware of this and they need to be concerned about this and and they need to start uh, planning for it. Billy. Yeah, going back a point to Mike Height first, and I'll come back to uh, to Joe's question. you mentioned it uh, should not be described as health care, and it's rarely, rarely happened. But we both know both parties use an isolated or very infrequent event for rallying cries. So okay. they, they develop totally out of proportion. So that's what one thing's doing now. I find that it's interesting with this particular uh, debate in Ohio. It started with the Secretary of State, who has aspiration of becoming a U.S. Senator, uh, categorizing as a fight against abortion. But after he made this early uh, uh, Pavado statement, he and his fellow Republicans backed off. They did not use uh, abortion issue at all. They said it was to keep from out-of-state interests coming into the state, and that's why we need to strengthen our Constitution of what can get on the ballot. We're being influenced too much by out-of-state. They took that tack. 
The Democrats, though, did not. The Democrats took up uh, what the Secretary of State said and said it is pure and simple, simple abortion. So now that the election's over, the uh, the uh, Republicans keep saying, no, it was not about abortion at all. It was about these other issues. Therefore, we have a reasonable chance of prevailing in November when it will be about abortion. Uh, I think that's going to be a very interesting question. I don't think many people uh, were uh, were uh, hiding behind the banner that it was not an abortion issue when the Secretary of State very clearly outlined the uh, the the terms of of, of a warfare, if you will, abortion against non-abortion. I, it's a. I think it's a. Uh, and I am going to agree very much with Mike Height and, and what Joe's uh, talking about. It, it it's going to become an issue. Not it has become an issue. Started with Kansas. Started in a couple of other states. It's going to become more and more of an issue, both at the state level and also the 2024. Uh, people say, well, it's it's not going to develop legs. I think it has. I think it will develop even more legs. The question in my mind is what's what the uh, what are the Republicans going to use? What major issue they're going to use? Taking personalities of of Trump and Biden out of the equation. What are the Republicans going to use as an issue to counter the re, the abortion issue the Democrats are going to pose? Alonzo, well, it, it's really going to start from us talking about it. And just to, I guess, answer Joe's question first, he asked, you know, is this a problem for Republicans? And it is. It is because, not because we're pro-life, but because uh, we haven't been equipped with the tools to talk about the issue on a national stage yet. For years and years and years, the pro-choice community, they would win by just not having this issue discussed whatsoever. So, uh, you know, they would not allow the conversation to even go near abortion, and that's what helped them win. And you got to think that, you know, through years of judicial malfeasance with the Roe case, that, you know, there was a conflict in the sense of uh, what courts should be able to do with political issues like um, the practice of abortion and uh, so forth. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to talk about the issue and, and get it down to its fine and refined points, right? Because everyone that I've talked to from the pro-choice community, they can't answer two questions that I have for them when we talk about abortion. I tell them, uh, explain it to me like a five-year-old. And once they start to uh, tell me, you know, what, what's happening during the process of abortion, like they were explaining it to a five-year-old, I asked them then at that point, um, is it or why is killing wrong? And once we get to that point, it's, it's you know, it gets combative or it gets into, you know, a, a, a point. But if you run through those questions with anyone you know about abortion, you start to realize that the issue in itself is not ever being discussed. We talk about all of the periphery things. We talk about, you know, oh, well, what about so many kids in foster care, poverty, uh, you know, all of this uh, outside information, but we're not talking about the act in itself. So what Republicans are going to have to do is they're going to have to talk about it, even though it's uncomfortable, and we're going to have to uh, uh, understand that people have been conditioned by society to find this practice acceptable when it isn't. And uh, that's my whole take on it. Um, we have work to do. Goes back to you, Joe. Yeah, Alonzo, I, I agree with what you say there as in terms of the strategy. I think the other strategy the Republicans have to look at is I, I think they have been caught down in the weeds here on the abortion question. And, and really efforts and discussions at regulating abortion, that narrow question, is a trap that I think they've fallen into. If, if, if the Republicans want to be the party for a culture of life, then it has to be all-encompassing. They need to be talking about uh, social services and supporting them, supporting adoptive services, poor, supporting f foster care services, uh, you know, having counseling available for women who are going through this. It, it really has to be more of a, a larger question for them to address. And I think if they do that, they could be more effective than just being seen as regulating a medical procedure, because that, that in and of itself is, is too narrow. 
and, and I think it's, it's, it's confining them in how they're responding to what clearly is going to be uh, an onslaught uh, at the state level of certain ballot measures being on the ballot in 2024 to drive people to the polls. You can be sure the Democrats are going to do that. And so the Republicans are going to have to have an answer for it. And I think that's one way to, to respond. The other thing I would say, which is very interesting coming up in this Iowa primary, Iowa has, as a state, some of the most restrictive abortion laws in the country. And these candidates who are up there on stage are going to be asked at a debate that's coming up soon and also at the state fair and everywhere else they're appearing in Iowa, what are your positions on abortion? And the question I think that they're going to have to be prepared to answer is, should I answer it the way a majority of Iowans want this question answered? Or do, should I answer this the way that nationally is going to make me more, more viable as a candidate based upon the results we've seen so far in some of these states that have had statewide elections on this very issue? I, I think that's going to be an interesting dilemma that these candidates for the Republican nomination are going to have to address. And, and I'll be curious to see how they do it, because I, I got to tell you. Uh, the one guy who, who's looking pretty smart about at least sidestepping that little dilemma is the guy who's probably not going to show up for the debate and isn't campaigning in Iowa, and that's Donald Trump. So he's not going to be pigeonholed while these others may be forced to take positions that nationally might not serve them well. Joe, you mentioned counseling as uh, part of your discussion earlier. Were you referring to counseling of women who are considering an abortion well, counseling dealing with the effects of an unwanted pregnancy. Look, there, we have plenty of women in this country who, through, through various situations, have unwanted pregnancies. Uh, the laws are such now that, that uh, many of these women are going to be carrying these babies to term. Uh, I, I can't begin to imagine. I'm not a woman. I, I can't begin to imagine how that might affect them. And I think that the counseling they're going to need is dealing with those situations. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, you know certain <clears throat> options are not available to them, uh, depending on where they live, uh, and, and of course you know the dealing with the situation of, of having to, to raise that child after birth, and of course the circumstances under which that pregnancy occurred. All of that can be very traumatizing, and I think we have to recognize that those services, especially counseling, are going to be necessary for these women. Quick question before we wrap up this segment here. Uh, Larry, I'll go to you first. You have read for years how Americans polled on abortion, uh, a bit more than half, uh, don't believe in unfettered abortion. They believe there should be some type of restriction uh, or regulation on it in, in some form or fashion. Yet we're seeing these turnouts at polls where we're getting an opposite read on that. Your take on that, Larry? Well, there's a couple of things here. I did want to say this. Let's keep in mind that what Ohio did was they ended up with a referendum on their November ballot about abortion. And the legislature said, oh, it's 58 to 37 or whatever, and so, or 58 to 42, let's make it 60. And that's what this vote recently was about. It's like, we're going to change the rules in the middle of the election. And a lot of people, regardless of what they thought about abortion, just said, that ain't fair. The other thing is, this is a complicated medical procedure, and we say that, well, these cases that I spoke about earlier are rare. Each one of them involves a human life, or two human lives. And so if you are pro-life, you got to have a set of rules that will accommodate the people who, for whom a pregnancy could be a death sentence. Well, I'm glad you admitted that there were two human lives there. Yeah, well, here's the yeah. thing. It, it, I have to take it from your point of view and say, if there are two human lives, then you can't be the pro-life party if you're saying, well, it's only a couple of women in Texas whose doctors were afraid. Those are human lives. Those women are human lives. And so I think this is a lot more complicated medically than anybody in the political realm is acknowledging. Any other comments before we go to the break? Uh, so after the legislature um, and our pro-life bills, there's only been four uh, different procedures that happened in the state of West Virginia, and I don't know the nature of all of them. I think two of them were life of the mother. And, um, you know, it 
it, this is a hard topic. It's a, you know, it's a very divisive topic. And I just, there, there needs to be more dialogue around it and um, to, to bring people to at least understand, you know, why I believe what I believe. And, Do you know, we know even, how many women have left the state? Uh, and no. no, and there's no way to know that. Admiral. Yeah. Uh, when Roe versus Wade was overturned, everybody looked at it as saying it's a state's rights issue. It was kind of an abstract state's rights. With every state uh, that has invoked a more restrictive abortion, uh, there have been uh, – isolated or individual stories and these individual stories there's one in Ohio having to travel so many far these are the ones that have put life to this Roe versus Wade decision it's become personalized as we were talking earlier Mike uh, these personalized incidents can become rallying cries and that's exactly I think what happened in Kansas it happened in Ohio recently these isolated examples where someone is some individuals having to suffer because of the more restrictive laws is why, why people are backing up and pushing back. We go to break, and uh, Bill, you're on the clock up next. And we welcome back our uh, Friday crew here via telephone, Joe, Joey Torts Ferretti. Joe, we still have you? We do, and I, I must say that, uh, Rob, you are spot on with nicknames, and, and those Badger <laughs> name for, for Mike is, is probably the most appropriate one I've heard. You know, when you look at Mike now, you got to think Badger. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you just got to think Badger, and, and not the friendly <laughs> mas- no, not the, not the, not the friendly Badger, not the mascot for Wisconsin oh, no. everybody loves. This is not a Wisconsin <laughs> Badger. The, the prickly one, the prickly Badger, rabbit Badger, <laughs> rabbit porcupine. <ass. laughs> so, how many people were actually watching the legislature? When when I when I went on my rant, I think it's a lot like uh, when we were younger. Don Larson's perfect game in the World yeah. Series, maybe fifty thousand people saw that because, <laughs> you know, and afterward everybody saw it. So I think it's kind of like that. But the fact we don't need to see it to take enjoyment out of it, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> imagine you having to put him and visualizing everybody. Right. That's good. Next time, I would ask that they put a blood pressure monitor on him while he's delivering it. I think just watching the blood pressure go up would be would great fun for me. And a, and a uh, corporate <laughs> blood pressure monitor for everybody in the, in, the, in the room. The great part about not having video evidence of this, because apparently there's no recording of it either, uh, is that I can, in my mind, go Khrushchev-esque on this one and see Mike taking off his shoe and just beating the podium with the heel of his shoe. <laughs> circa I Khrushchev. Will, I will destroy you. I will destroy you. I can see that happening here. Uh, joined in the room also by Alonzo Perry and the Mike Carl C. Welcome back, Alonzo. Hey, how's it going? The Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Mr. Right. Lawrence, you were slow on the re- on the replay there. <laughs> Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Good morning. And uh, Larry, uh, we were talking about it, you know, attorneys. You had uh, the cute story there at the beginning of the show about attorneys. This is National Presidential Joke Day and uh, also quotes. So I have this one from John Adams for you to kind of go hand in hand with your story, Larry. As President John Adams once said, in my many years, I've come to a conclusion that one useless man is a shame, two is a law firm. And three or more is Congress. <laughs> <laughs> well said by John. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> that one has survived over 200 years now. So uh, we move on to issue number two. And for that, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Uh, I'll say thanks, Rob. I'm a little late, but you cut me off before I had a chance to respond. <laughs> thanks for doing uh, Prior to the, uh, or as he was preparing for the new, uh, his indictment in New York, uh, uh, President Trump said, protest, protest, we need to take our nation back. Later he said, a lot less subtle, it's time, we just can't allow this anymore. We must save America. Protest, protest, protest. We've seen three indictments so far, New York, one in Florida, and more, one more recent in New York, uh, excuse me, Washington, D.C., the protests have been minimal. A, a couple of three people with a with a flag in New York, practically nothing in Florida and in and, uh, uh, D.C. My question is, why? Why have we not seen these masses of people responding to the president's <coughs> President uh, Trump's request to protest? Protest. We must protest to save America. All right. Let's start with Michael Height. Well, I think most people um, saw what happened January 6th and like, all right, maybe we shouldn't protest like that. Um, and, and maybe you're still going to see the protest. You're going to see the protest at the polls. 
Um, and, and I think there are enough people out there that, that truly believe this is a witch hunt, whether, whether you do or not. I mean, there are people out there that do. And I think the, the, the Trump protest will come at the polls. It won't be in mass um, like what everybody thinks a protest normally is. That was quick. Hey, straight, straight to the point. To I mean, point, I, yeah. I can't oh. rant all the time. <laughs> you know, it's that blood pressure thing. But once, you know, I mean, you call it up with more than that. Yeah, that well, if Larry, if, if Larry me- mentions Reagan, you might get a rant. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Larry. Um, I think that um, as we um, go along through this, we find more and more and more cases where the um, the thing that we want to do and the thing that we end up doing in a legislative setting um, starts to veer apart. And sometimes the initial idea is okay, but then to get to a one rule for the whole state or government, we have to make judgments about the situation that aren't quite uh, what we expected them to be. Having said all that, they did see a thousand people get indicted, and most of them have been tried, and a good big number of them have gone to um, have gone to prison. And so now the the um, president, when he says protest. He's being careful. He's certainly not saying, go to the Congress, stop Mike Pence, Uh, (laughs) like he pretty much did on January 6th, because that's a crime, as he's found out. Um, I I don't think there are going to be any kind of protests in front of any courthouses. I do think that there may be a segment of people who were already going to vote anyway, who are going to vote maybe a little more harshly at the margins. In other words, uh, they'll in the primaries, maybe they'll pick the more right-wing guy than they would have two years ago or three years ago. I don't think in the end, though, that Donald Trump is going to be able to continue to manage this forever um, by ads while he is under indictment. So there's going to come a time where the things that he says are going to get limited by these judges. And we always say, well, what about the First Amendment? Well, the First Amendment has some limits on it, as anyone who's under bail in this county could tell you. You're not allowed to say things about the witnesses in your case on Facebook while you're on bail. You're not allowed to attack the judges. And if you do, they'll bring you in and say, would you like to go to jail for a day or two and see what it feels like? I mean, what are you are you testing me? Because you don't have the right to do this. You don't have the right to travel. You know, a lot of felony crimes in in a very common thing is you can't go to Hagerstown or or Winchester uh, while your case is pending. And so there are limitations on your rights. And I think as Donald Trump continues this, there's going to have to be one of these judges, maybe the Georgia judge, when that day comes will have to say, hold it. You're not you're not going to be allowed to continue doing this. But I'm running for president. Sorry. You know, don't get arrested before you run for president next time. I don't know what to tell you. So. <laughs> Al- Alonzo. You know why uh, Republicans aren't protesting right now? It's because we have jobs. We have jobs. So we're working people. You know, uh, Republicans. It is the lowest unemployment in my lifetime. Re- Republicans right now are, you know. <laughs> You're going to get Heights blood pressure going, Larry. <laughs> Republicans in general, we're introverted people a lot of the times. Uh, we're charitable people. Um, we're not people that get in a stir. You know, we're law-abiding people. Uh, I, I think that, you know, Republicans as a, a, a general Stubblefield group, is openly laughing at you. Yeah, and, 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 well, this when is, you this say is, that, I'm thinking about January 6th. Well, uh, so this, is, this does bring up that point. Yeah. It brings up January 6th, and it's like, okay, well, what would turn, you know, a group of people that obviously – are not going to, you know, are law-abiding and charitable and nice people, what would make them, you know, uh, take it to the extent that it went? It wasn't like directly from the Trump uh, speech. These people went and tore down through the Jersey barriers. I mean, they stood outside. They, you know, 
waited and watched the procedural event going on inside of Congress, and then concussion grenades started to explode, and then even on one of the Capitol Police officers' body cams, there was one of the officers talking to another and said, when we throw these concussion grenades, we turned one person mad into ten. They said that. That's not something that I'm making up or is coming from my personal opinion. This is from their observable reality. So it, it begs the question, uh, are there some things that took place that day that maybe we haven't looked at in the full scale of the entirety of its event? And what would cause people that are of, you know, our political affiliation and our belief system to, to be so angry? You know, that's that's all I'm asking. I mean, uh, that's why I believe there's no protest. Joe Ferretti. Well, a couple thoughts. Uh, I am surprised that uh, Trump hasn't been able to get Roy Epps and other FBI operatives to show up and fake a uh, at least fake a, a protest at uh, some of these uh, criminal justice events. But uh, secondly, the. Uh, you know, what, what we have to understand, and I think, uh, Alonzo, as you go through your legal career, uh, you, you'll learn this. Uh, you know, people question what, why are these folks who broke into the Capitol, why are they being prosecuted and why are they being sentenced so heavily? There is a deterrence factor in the criminal justice system that, uh, that plays out every time. And that is whenever people suffer the consequences of their illegal act. It's a message to all. Don't do this. And I think it's clear that a lot of folks don't want to show up and suffer the consequences of having a 10 or 15 year sentence because things get out of control and you get caught up in the moment. And before we know it, you're trying to storm a courthouse or something like that. I, I think that's one thing that's a play here. And secondly, uh, you know, Donald Trump's no dummy. Uh, he is going to try everything in his power to have these cases vetted in the court of public opinion. And he is constantly reminding the judicial officers and, and the judges who are overseeing these cases that he does have a rabid following. And even though his conduct would ordinarily result in a revoking of bail and, 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 and a jailing of him, when you threaten judges and you threaten witnesses in a lead up to your criminal prosecution, that usually gets you in trouble. Judges are human, and any judge sitting there thinking, what am I going to do with this guy who won't shut up and who won't you know, allow this process to play out without massive interference? What do I do? Well, she's going to, today she's going to warn the attorneys and she's going to be stern and all that, but she's not going to revoke his bail, and she's not going to throw him in jail for his conduct even though it might warrant that. And she's, and she's not going to do that because she's going to be concerned about larger societal uh, problems that may occur if something like that would happen. So he is immunizing himself to some extent by constantly uh, exhorting his followers to protest because he knows that's exactly what no federal or state judge is going to want to have to deal with if they have to come down on him. Uh, it's an interesting pl ploy by him, but I think it's one that's going to prove effective. But it works in the equal and opposite end as well. I mean, you know, why isn't Trump in jail? Uh, l l l hear me out. If this guy is as bad as he has been made to seem, he tried to overthrow the government of the United States. If he is truly, I mean, he's got a bunch of money. He could be a flight risk. He could, you know, uh, there's there's a, a bunch of unknowns here. Then if, if this is the case, why is he not being charged with insurrection? Why is he not being charged with, you know, or why is he not being held in jail without, you know, the option for bail when he has the, the means and the ability to completely devoid or, or run away from all this? It's it's it, it works kind of both ways with that logic. In the sense that, you know, um, the way that we're handling this and the way – like we're in a prisoner's dilemma, and I think you could you would agree with that, Joe. Uh, th this s situation is not going to be rectified by us, you know, uh, saying that um, 
where am I going? This this idea that that Trump has done these terrible crimes and and he needs to be prosecuted is not. It's just it's selectively omitting so much information that needs to be discussed. And so I'm happy with this going to the courts because I'm uh, excited to see what his attorneys are finally going to be able to subpoena and bring up to the American people. That's honestly how I feel about this whole situation. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Joe. You had a thought. You had a thought. Well, yeah, I was going to say the re- that's exactly the reason why he's not being charged with insurrection uh, because Jack Smith has very smartly decided I'm not trying January 6th over again. I'm not going to have Roy Epps carted up there as a witness to testify about whether or not he's an FBI informant who egged everybody on. He didn't want to go down that path, and I think that was a smart thing to do. He charged the crimes that he can very simply prove. As you said, uh, that you can explain to a five-year-old. Uh, that's what he wants to do. And I think that's what prosecutorial discretion is all about, and I think that's why you have the crimes charged that they are. And the reason why Trump's not arrested right now is he's not an imminent threat. He's a public citizen. He doesn't hold public office. There's not much he can do other than rant and rave on Twitter. So uh, he's not the kind of threat that you jail right now. Uh, you, you, you let him out. You let him assist in his defense. You give him every due process, which is what we want him to have. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, he, he is still trying to try this case in the court of public opinion, and it's going to have uh, – there's no question it's going to have the effects on, on how these judges handle him going forward. I can assure you, any defendant out there who would threaten a federal judge or threaten witnesses, as he has already done, would suffer grave consequences. He won't because of who he is and the power that he has. Uh, that, that's all, my only point. I, I, I got to get the bill for a final okay. point before we get too far behind. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, okay. I think a couple of things. Uh, watching the the reason not more protests. Watching the uh, the sentences been handed down uh, by the various courts, individuals involved January the sixth uh, has something to do with it. I think also Mike Height made a good point uh, that the protest will be done at the election box than anywhere else. All right, and we go to issue number three with Mike Kite. You can lead off with yep. your comment to close down the segment if you want. Well, my comment was just to thank Alonzo for pointing out my introverted nature. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my, my topic is That's too good right there. <laughs> I'll go to a state level issue. Um, so we've had months now of, of severance um, taxes coming in lower than projected. Um, and so my question to the the uh, the panel is: Are the days of the huge surpluses in the state of West Virginia over? Let's start with Larry Schultz, who has experience in the extraction field. Lawrence? Yes, I I never had much experience in paying the taxes on it, but but I did uh, keep track of the costs pretty well for a couple of years. Um, I think there could be something to that. I don't quite understand it because the price of gas and the price of natural gas doesn't seem to have plummeted um are our is our production down or is is that what's causing the shortage and if so then why um they've just had um an approval of the mountain valley pipeline right and so they're gonna have to fill that pipe up with something um and let's you know let's hope it's not pepperoni rolls um <laughs> <laughs> However, if it is, <laughs> you know that we don't want to wreck the market on pepperoni rolls. I would like another pipeline with marinara sauce in it for the dipping purposes, if that's going to be used in that manner. Um, and so, I don't know what's going on on the production side. Um, the, I mean, it could be that we're just about on the verge of tipping over and heading into tapped off and done which would make it kind of odd that we just built this brand new pipeline through the mountains and we got nothing in our state to put in it. I'm I'm not sure what's causing that, but whatever it is until somebody identifies it and says, here's why it's not going to be a long-term thing. I think we should assume that the days of the big surpluses are over. Billy. Yeah. Uh, Severance tax is going to take a hit. We got used to the COVID money. Uh, we've had, as we went through the budget reduction uh, uh, discussion, everybody kept painting this rosy picture, and the picture was we're going to continue 
tomorrow as we are today, ignoring the fact that the economy of any community or any state is very cyclical in nature. We're going to have bad times or hard times in addition to good times. I found it very frustrating in all the discussions. The cyclical nature was never discussed. It's always it's going to be a rosy, rosy, rosy projection, and I think that was a mistake. Alonzo. So, uh, no, I don't think the surplus is going to end because I just paid my personal property taxes. <laughs> and Man. The the appraisal value of everything went up. So I mean, no, I don't. I, well, to be serious, uh, I I do think that the the surpluses will continue. Probably not to the volume that they are, but I do have hope that uh, some of the investments that were made in the state it, and and just the the, the stewardship, economic stewardship, um, is just one thing that I, I haven't criticized the legis- legislator for of the many things that I've you know criticized for in in the past, but. Um, I, I do think that uh, we will continue to see surpluses, and I do think that the, the whole issue with energy right now is a very temporary uh, apparatus, and I, I have hope that one day you know, we'll, we'll f- focus on getting more of this natural gas out of the state and more of the coal and find ways to you know, uh, make that a, a viable option to continue to be a, a strong energy-producing state in the country. Um, I think that that's going to be our, our, our guiding path, even to this day. Torts. Well, I, uh, Badger, I appreciate you bringing this issue up uh, <laughs> because I think that uh, the severance tax, we, we know, we've discussed the boom and bust cycle that the severance taxes uh, go through. But also concerning to me is, a de- I believe, the sales tax revenues uh, coming in are decreasing, and, and that's a bad sign. Uh, but I, I'm wondering, uh, did you get a little heartburn, Mike, when you were sitting down there a few days ago handing out money left and right? Uh, granted, it was surplus money, and, and in many cases uh, the, the expenditures were needed. But, I mean, the way they were handing money out in the face of, of this, this troubling trend that we're seeing for the last few months, I just wondered if, if you know, there was a possibility of maybe banking some of that money for a rainy day and not not just the rainy day fund, but you know, putting aside other money uh, somehow so that that uh, we can kind of smooth things out because that's always been the issue with severance taxes is is trying to smooth out uh, the fact that it does go through boom and bust and and oftentimes the state in some years is flush and in some states is trying to catch some years is trying to catch up. So uh, you know, what was your reaction sitting down there? Uh, going through that uh, situation on Monday and Tuesday. I felt like Oprah. You get a million. You get a million. You get a million. I mean, sitting in the fin- – we sat in finance committee for 10 hours, 10 hours going over this, arguing back and forth about uh, about some of this. And the, the, the numbers on the call were even higher than what we approved. We, we cut a lot of these um, – these issues when they came before us in the finance committee we were like you know no you know that's that's too much um we're not going to do it there were uh, there was a uh, a program that um that we voted on last session that uh, the governor wanted 250 million dollars for this program and we gave him 125 million last session and then he put on the call this session um to get another 175 million and everybody was like, well, "Wait a minute! It started at two fifty. We've already given you one twenty-five. One seventy-five doesn't equal two fifty. So you know there were a lot of times when instances like that where the the uh, the finance committee was doing their due diligence and and pulling it back and saying, no, we're not going to just keep giving this money away. Um, I believe they did the same thing with the." Um, the smoothing bill of the rainy day fund, you know, that they wanted to smooth things out over a seven year period. And, and, and a lot of our opinions, um, why seven years? We, you know, we were looking at that and saying, well, they picked seven years because that's, that's what made the numbers work. They wanted another 140 four hundred and fifty million dollars to spend so you do this and you don't have to put as much money in the rainy day fund and a lot of us are like no that that doesn't work either when when severances are going down now is the time to be prudent now is the time to say no we should be putting money back and making sure that we that our rainy day fund 
is is secure, you know, and and we can't right now the way it's set up we're going to give 230 million dollars into the rainy day fund and you want to drop that all the way down to 87 and and the majority of us in, in finance are like no we're, we just can't approve that um and that bill died in in finance committee so i believe we are being prudent even though it seemed like we were just being oprah um i can assure you we weren't Mm-hmm. And it does come back to you if you have an additional final word, but Alonzo has a comment first. Well, and it's like, you know, all of this is artificial because we have, you know, massive amounts of coal. And it's not like any other people in the world aren't going to coal. A lot of uh, countries are restarting up their coal plants. We could be a massive exporter if we would just unlock the ability to mine for coal and, and uh, you know, uh, allow West Virginians to do what West Virginians love. I mean, we could make a significant amount of money, but these are artificial failures being promoted by the federal government. And, and a lot of times there are artificial numbers. So when you look at severance, these are these are projections that are given by the the um, the governor and his team. So when you see a a shortfall or a surplus, it's based on his projections and and how it fits into the budget. So um, where we saw all these surpluses in years past, it was because he kept projections low. Well, if he's raised projections, and that's why you're now seeing a a, a negative in, in severance. It, that could be the reason because he's upped the the whole um, severance uh, projection. Do you, do you suppose there could be a problem with putting a guy who can't seem to pay his taxes in charge of all this? I, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I'm you'll not have to sure. talk to the majority of West Virginians. Be, I mean, yeah. you, you can't. But as far no, as I look at it, it, Republicans didn't put him in office. Um, we may have done it the second time, but we didn't the first time. So. Um, you would have to look at the Democratic would, Party for it that. It just seems difficult to me to take the word of Jim Justice about how much money there is, and here's the prudent budgetary plan. Uh, no matter what party you're in, that just simple economics and simple history, shall we say. Um, I'm not sure that I would be c- capable of saying, oh, well, the governor has projected thus and such, and well, therefore we should... Go along. Well, I, when it came I, to the I'm rainy day not. fund, I'll tell you, and I'm going to disclose something that happened in committee only because it's open to the public and anybody can see it if they want to. So, I'll as we just, learned, you know, right. Um, so, the the governor's um, finance guy in there, um, Mr. Hardy, was in there explaining the bill and and the rainy day fund and what this all to do to to finance. And somebody asked him point blank. Do you believe this is a good bill? Do you believe we should be doing this? His answer was, the governor supports this. Now, I can tell you right now, I can read between the lines. Dude didn't like it. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Dave Hardy always gives that answer. A couple of words, uh, notes on the uh, surplus numbers the past month. Uh, We had Finance Chairman Eric Tarr on this week, and he said that some of that was uh, because of the timing of the payments that were being made. Delegate Mike Hornby just texted me and said the same. So maybe February, uh, not uh, February, but uh, August numbers. Be better. We'll see uh, a difference there. Mm. This is uh, National Presidential Joke Day, and that includes quotes. And our latest uh, one for today is from Teddy Roosevelt, who said, when they call roll in the Senate, the senators do not know whether to answer present or not guilty. Theodore Roosevelt, who once in an assassination attempt, was shot in the chest and then continued his speech. Yeah, that was in Buffalo. We're talking about a tough guy here. All right, Larry, you are on the clock. Um, Clarence Thomas clearly lied when he said he preferred hanging out with ordinary folk in Walmart parking lots as he and his wife traveled around the uh, country uh, in their RV. And we know this because we've learned about the luxury yachts. Uh, vacations and the private jet flights. However, it now turns out that the humble RV he and Jenny go around the country and itself was a two hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollar boondoggle financed by yet another wealthy friend. Here's the question: Does anyone on the panel think this is acceptable behavior from anyone worthy of the name Justice? Well, is that a Jim Justice? 
Slam, you're working in there too, Larry? No. <laughs> it's a Justice Thomas slam. Just, just based on the way you ended the last segment, I was just curious if you get another, another shot in there. Turning the, that was just a know. coincidence. All right, Alonzo, let's begin with you. So uh, I want to, does this affect his ability to uh, view cases, in your opinion? It does for two reasons. First of all, because to the extent that there is some influence behind it, it directly affects it. But even if you could prove that it doesn't, the appearance of impropriety, which is a very important thing for judges, is off the charts. That he's taken money from people who his rulings benefit. And it's just, you can't do this. The appearance of impropriety is horrible. See, I, I just, I don't understand how that's, you know, gives the appearance of impropriety when we've talked about this before, too, where Ruth, Gator, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg went and officiated a gay wedding, but still got to sit on the bench and rule on the gay wedding case before her in the Supreme Court. That took place. That's impropriety. She should have recused herself from that actual uh, ruling. And, you know, to, to say that because he drives around in an RV, which he does talk to ordinary people on his trips, um, I've heard, you know, very good things about him, you know, uh, talking to individuals that, you know, are on these journeys that he takes. And, I mean, what kind of life do you want a so, like a Supreme Court justice to have? Do you want them to be like? I want him to have a life that he pays in, for himself. Some, <laughs> yes, cooped inside some, <laughs> some, you know, uh, prison cell, waiting to you know go out and like make a ruling about society. I mean, you know, you can have friends, you can have people that you know that give you things, you know, and it's not going to sway or change the way that you. Uh, exercise your jurisprudence. He has a style. You can almost tell how he's going to vote on something before uh, the case actually comes because he's an originalist. You know, he is true to form. And uh, to to suggest that there's anything outside that's influencing, you know, his behavior in the court is just a ridiculous notion. Billy? Yeah, they've gone back several years looking at his voting record, and he votes 100% in favor of the people that have access or have promoted some of his, his interests. Look it up, Alonzo. It is it, there. The other thing is Clarence Thomas makes me yearn for the day that we have term limits because I don't think you can get rid of him. I, I don't think there's any appetite to get him to resign. Uh, there's a lot of rhetoric. They hope he'll resign. It's not going to happen. So until we have term limits to all of our elected officials, we're going to have instances such as this. Mr. Height. Or Badger. So, <laughs> two things. Um, one is he said he preferred to hang out with people at Walmart. It didn't say he didn't hang out with people that are that have lavish lifestyles. He just preferred the people at Walmart. So I have to take him at his word there. Have the you been to things, Walmart? I, I have. I, I, <laughs> He prefers hanging out with people in their pajamas, all right? Um, the other thing, the important, uh, the important word in, in your comments was he financed. Somebody didn't give him the money. He financed the money. So it would be no different than he went to a bank, and he has to rule on banking issues all the time. So I don't see the impropriety as long as the, there is transparency in the actual financing and, and, and how much he paid and, and that it was at a, a comparable rate. I mean, even if it was at a lower rate, I'd still be okay with it. Um, he financed it, so he and his wife paid for it. But, but do they pay back? He never told, he yeah, never, he, he he never told anybody about this. <laughs> the press found out about it on their own. This was never in any of the reports. They're supposed to report their financial... Uh, dealings, and he hasn't reported any of it. If I if I borrow your RV, would I have to report that? If I just borrowed it, if I if I drove around, it's not uh, mine. Uh, it's not my possession. I don't hold the title. Yeah, I mean, I think let's say you're a circuit judge, and and you you like to go RVing, but you don't have enough money to buy one, and I give you mine, and then two months later, I'm trying a case in front of you. Somebody on the other side, I may not think it's a problem. You may not think that's, it's a problem. Somebody on the other side I, may I say, guess, well, that, Schultz is providing his vacations if, for him. But if, if, if a judge is buying a house or a boat or an RV or whatever it is, do they have to disclose that they went to um, 
BCT to get the loan, and and this is what they paid, and yada yada yada. All that has to be disclosed. I I don't know exactly what's required to be reported, but if you're getting any kind of a special deal, and we don't have any idea what the deal actually is, yeah, they should have to report it. But but they should if they but if they maybe they should, but do they have to? And if they don't have to, then he didn't do any there's no impropriety if he actually financed the person didn't give him the money didn't give him the rb well that depends he financed on, it well it depends on whether he's making the payments or not and we don't have access to that right i mean i, I could finance it and then call you up five minutes after you sign the papers and say don't worry about those payments badger you know we're good um, you could. You know, I could. Is, I'm not going to because uh, I don't have the money, but I could, <laughs> theoretically. I mean, but, but honestly, do, you, do we, like, are we taking into account how hard it is for something to get to the Supreme Court? I mean, you know, not only, I mean, just, just go through it. You have to go through all of these lower level courts, right? You have to get to one of the circuits. After it gets one of the circuits, you have to get four other judges to agree with you to even see a case that has to do with a constitutional issue. They don't just wait up one day and this is this is on the benefit of or to the benefit of people that understand that the public doesn't know about uh, these legal uh, structures because they don't get to just wake up one day and grab something and then say this is what we're gonna rule on today no there's a whole process that is so far removed from just my buddy you know billionaire wants me to do this for him Alonzo, crazy Alonzo isn't that called deflection no, it's not, it it's is not deflecting. deflecting. What your it your is, argument is, now is deflecting rational. from the issue. Bill, just call him a rhino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that big horn is on a rhino for deflection. I mean, there's there's a lot of ver- there's a lot of verbal virtuosity going on over here, but it's not rooted in fact. You know? Joe, Joe Ferretti. Well, I, I don't. Why is he? No, first of all, the answer to the Badgers uh, question. The, my understanding is from my reading, this, these are outright gifts. Lock, stock, and barrel. They bought him the RV. They have financed, not not loans, but they have paid for over thirty eight vacations. They are buy. They bought a home for one of his family members. This is these are outright gifts, and the reporting requirements are you have to report gifts, just like the president has to report gifts. From foreign dignitaries and foreign governments, it's a reporting requirement under the ethics rules, and he has not done that. And so the issue is, you know, there is congressional oversight here, and he can be referred to the attorney general for not reporting, not following through with his the requirements by law. So that that's the issue. The second thing is, why is he getting all this money? He's not earning it, right? He's, he's not, he hasn't done any labor or service to these billionaires who see fit to bestow him with all these gifts. So why is he getting this money? It's influence. It's the very thing that Hunter Biden's being accused of, getting money for nothing. Yeah, and and the, I, I think that in some respects you can equate those two situations. There's a, 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 a world of a difference in the fact that being having access to the vice president in conference calls with your business, uh, I mean, that's – there's so much easier access to make policy changes than someone in the Supreme Court who doesn't change policy whatsoever. They physically are they, – they change the actual structure of how the Constitution is interpreted. Their whole responsibility is to interpret the Constitution. They don't make laws. That is the, the responsibility of the executive and the legislative branches that, that uh, work on that lawmaking function. And, and it's just it, – it, it's mind-blowing to say, oh, this is just like the Hunter Biden thing because he's using an RV that may belong to someone else. That's the same as physically being in international business calls, uh, selling access to the White House and strong arming uh, foreign companies and foreign countries with taxpayer money. I mean, that's just it's a world of a difference. you're, You're perverting what I said. I said in some respects, this is just all about influence. That's all it is. If if 
if Justice Thomas is getting all his gifts, okay, with no terms of repayment, here's your RV, here's your vacation paid for, why are these billionaires motivated to do that? Answer that question. Why would they bestow him all these gifts if it wasn't to get influence? Unlike Mike Carl, they didn't go to law school with him. (laughs) (laughs) Is the the issue that he's he's getting the gifts or or that some of them aren't reported? What's the biggest issue? I ask anybody here at the table. I think it's a bit of both. I think it's a form. Here's the issue. That he's not reporting them? No, no, getting the gifts. Getting the gifts. He should know better in in either way. Uh, So if 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 you're getting... If you're getting financing, if you're getting gifts, you should be reporting it. And even if it's above board and there's nothing illegal about it, you should still, with the position you have, you should be reporting it. So I will I will concede that fact. My wife works for the FDA. Every year we are required to fill out a financial report about every single thing that we own or invest in that's greater than $1,000 or source we earn money yep. from. So. So, some years back, I bought a few shares of Amazon stock that then split and then ran up in price. And because Amazon now also does uh, has a food wing, and my wife works for the FDA, but on the drug side and never touches anything that deals with food, we got a, a email that quickly said, "Listen, this is a conflict of interest, and if the amount of this stock goes over a certain amount of money, you must sell it, and you must tell us the date you sold it and the value you sold it by." with the implied a threat that if not, you can be terminated. And this is not a great amount of stock, okay? This is not life-changing money. So if we have to answer to that requirement, shouldn't a Supreme Court justice? And by keeping, keeping in mind, my wife has zero involvement on the food side of the FDA. Yeah, and a slippery slope receiving gifts. And if you receive one, you don't know what uh, the influence you're actually selling. I made a policy, and Mike Hyden, I've talked about this. When I was elected official, I never would accept even one cup of coffee. I feel so much concern about taking anything for someone because you don't know what they expect of you. They're not giving you something for free. They're going to expect something of you. And the safest thing is not to accept anything. Uh, and, and I think this is where, and, and I'm not saying Clarence Thomas is the only one. Right now, he is the, the, uh, uh, the poster child of doing it in great extremes. I think it's a mistake to accept a dollar. Bill, I wish you still refused coffee. Then you wouldn't run out here so fast every commercial break to get to the main <laughs> <laughs> Issue number five with a time crunch, Alonzo Perry. Ooh, which one should I go with? Let's see. Okay, so uh, I think this is interesting enough and we kind of touched on it this morning a little bit but uh, a lot of couples feel that they can't start or grow their families because of like disorder politics and the warped economy and the existing model that we have erects some barriers to uh, family formation Um, there's really high costs with childbirth and I wanted to ask everyone in the panel today if they think that we should make childbirth free in this country. Child, child birth, not child care. Child birth should be child free. Child birth, right. yes. Actually, Joe, Joe, you go first, and we, we have uh, three minutes, four minutes. Are, are, you, four advocating, minutes. are you advocating for government-sponsored uh, medical care? Uh, because that's the only way we can make it free. Um, I, I did look this up, Alonzo. The average cost for childbirth, fourteen dollars to $18,000 per birth. So, yeah, I mean, uh, again, we go back to that issue about culture of life. If, if we want to we we'll have that in this country. Uh, we could look at this issue and see how we can uh, perhaps encourage people uh, for childbirth and uh, for covering those expenses. Michael Height, the badger. Uh, kids cost way more than that. Trust me. Um, <laughs> and and no, the government should not be paying for childbirth or anything else like that. Um, if you're going to have a kid, you need to take responsibility for it and pay it for it the the whole way through. Billy. I think they, if they're eligible for Medicaid, then they should receive it. If they're eligible for Medicaid, it should include childbirth. What about those who aren't? No, I don't. I think it should be tied to a, uh, a means issue. Can they afford it or not? I don't believe in paying it for someone who brings in a $50,000 a year salary. But there are women that cannot afford it. 
so I do not want to jeopardize the woman or the child, so it should be available through Medicaid. Lawrence? And it, it is. I mean, yeah. as we speak, it is available through Medicaid. Um, I'm not sure that you would necessarily want to focus it just on that. Uh, I guess I go more with Joe. Um, there are a lot of things that happen in people's lives, horrible illnesses, um, cancers, different things that will put a stop on what has been a good life up till then and introduce a financial hemorrhage that will never end. Um, nursing homes uh, are, are a thing so, uh, that, do, that does that in some families um, where eventually the nursing home is going to end up with everything you have if you live long enough. And I would rather see us address that um, because any of us, even uh, even the youngest among us, uh, could end up in a car accident to put us in a nursing home tomorrow. And uh, everything you've ever earned, everything you ever will earn, will go down that they'll go down those tubes. Uh, so I'm not sure that drawing a line with childbirth um, makes any sense. The way to address that is to go see Danny Staggers on East John Street and um, 304-267-3915. That was a good plug. Final, final word goes back to you, Alonzo. Well, no, I, I think that, you know, uh, we talked about, you know, how the pro-life uh, movement needs to have a calling card. And I think that this is one of them that the, um, has actually been kind of gaining steam. And I always think it's kind of uh, strange to hear different Republicans talk about this issue. And uh, <laughs> I just, you know, I, I don't – I'm tired of paying for things for the left and saying that the right is not able to, you know, afford this or whatnot. And uh, I would love to see this be a national program to help families actually form. I know. Uh, <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> Final thoughts are next. Final thoughts, eight seconds apiece. Torts, you go first. To all Mountaineer fans, I highly recommend a trip to State College to experience a Penn State home game. Woo-hoo. I'm not sure where that came from, Larry Schultz. Yeah. <laughs> Babies don't need a vacation, but I still see them at the beach. I went up to one the other day and said, what are you doing here? You haven't worked a day in your life. <laughs> Bill Stubblefield. <laughs> For future discussion, what is meant by being a rhino? Mr. Alonzo Perry. Uh, Eisenhower dinner, we got Jack Posobiec, Alex Stein, and Ashley St. Clair, Berkeley County, uh, GOP.com. Mike Height, five seconds. Come out to the fair tonight and buy one of these delicious animals they're selling. It's 10 o'clock. Dave Ramsey's show is next. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg, and TV 10. We'll talk to you again in 70 short hours. Talk Sunday.